will be so important for the early game. Of course, G2 not just fighting MLXG, Xiaohu, and all of RNG, but all their fans here in Wuhan as well as we enter picks and bans. Zaya Gragg is taken off the board. Jarvan Kalista, very standard from what we've seen so far. I do far. like the Jarvan ban as a response to the Gragg, because it felt like RNG were really looking for a proactive jungler in particular and another jungle mismatch. Stylistically, these two players, MLXG and Trick, are polar opposites in terms of style. We can get into the nitty gritty later in the cast, but we expect MLXG to play around his lanes almost exclusively, and denying him options is important for the side of G2. RNG doing a G2 a bit of a favor by banning the Iron here because <laughs> we no need faith. <laughs> we need to see G2 or we need to see Trick on a more aggressive jungler. We can actually have an impact early because he needs to be able to match MLXG. You can't just sit back and farm versus this guy because he will just get his own lanes ahead. I hear he's a sick Nunu. He does play Nunu. Sick Nunu, I'm not too sure. We don't <laughs> want to see Nunu either. We need something where Trick can gank or counter gank so that Perks in the early game can get some help. Talia is available in this game here. She's been banned in some of the other ones. Galio as well, if people want to play these champions that can... God damn it, G2! <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, play these champions who can move around from mid. All right, well, aside from Deficio's crushing disappointment for all of Europe and specifically G2 Esports at the moment, the Nunu still has not been locked in, although I feel like they were doing that The just best for thing you. is they can't even <laughs> hear you or us. <laughs> they know. Uh, it looks like it will instead be the Lulu first pick. Much more standard from what we expect. Strong, aggressive pushing support paired with the power of the Arden. Very standard bot lane for G2. And will it just be something like the Twitch Janna as the response given that Janna versus Lulu was almost cemented? Or the Varus coming in from Uzi if true. he wants a stronger laning phase. And Varus with Janna to protect him in fights and build the Rage Blade is also very, very good, obviously. That would be the respect choice. This is Uzi, though, and the Vayne could certainly be around the corner. Yeah, the Twitch, Twitch. Twitch. That was the likely one that I mentioned. Okay. So. And here's the thing. If you're watching this matchup as a fan, you don't want to see Bars versus Tristana. You want both late game scaling carries. You want both of these guys to have the potential you to go off. You realize that you suggested that Uzi go on containment duty. No one contains Uzi. Hey, Uzi. you can carry as Varus. You can <laughs> win your lane. But Twitch, oh, it's so much sweeter, yeah. and it's a very nice answer to what we have in all the right. late game. All right, so we're getting something now from Trick that can actually match in the early game. MLXG, even on Sejuani, you would think, ah, he's just going to farm to level 6. No, 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 no. I've seen level 2 ganks, level 3 ganks, level 4 ganks, level 5 ganks. You need something that can at least apply pressure. That is what the Rek'Sai will bring from G2's side. Also, it works against the Twitch. And it would be clear our best if he went the Cinder Hulk build. He's in both Warrior and Cinder Hulk Rek'Sai. Played pretty commonly at this tournament. We'll see the rest of the draft will really suggest. In the ban phase, it's been almost purely mid lane focus. Of course, Galio can flex to the top side. And now the opportunity. G2 are going to get the last pick, but they're not even worried about it. They're saving it for top lane. Perk's feeling confident in the mid lane rise. We saw it yesterday as well. It is such an important pick in this current meta because it's a good laning phase where there's not really any matchup that shuts you down, and then you have that ulti to move you and your team around the map. This is really the game where we're harboring some of the, should I this say, This is really the game where we picks. wonder if people can hear Deficio, <laughs> both the Nunu and the Vayne hovered. Not going to be the case, however, but the Jace getting locked in so frequently banned away. And this is RNG saying, expect, can't take it in a carry matchup. That's part of the Jace. I'm thinking it's going to be top lane Jace. No, it's not. It's actually the mid lane Jace. Oh, interesting. A lot of physical damage then from RNG. G2 looking to just stack as much armor as possible. Wonder if they're going to play pure tank in the top lane for that reason, or if they want to just counter pick the Maokai. Trundle is there, Nar is there, Nasus is there. I got to say that. Shen also a possibility when it comes to a containment lane and also an armor stacker. But for Expect, getting his hands on the Nar, it's a good look for him. Likes to play those more carry oriented styles, even if he can be the tank for the team. And let's take a look at the lanes here because you have top lane counter pick for G2. Yep. With the Nar taking over that lane at least later on. Bot lane with the Lulu Tristana, we've seen that already beat Twitch Janna as well. And interesting here, Shahu has not played Jace at all this summer. Deciding to bring it out here against Perks, against G2 Esports. To me, Trick is the really interesting heartbeat to follow in this game because two out of three lanes, 
priority goes the way of G2 Esports. And if we can see a vintage jungle performance here, an aggressive one from the side of the Rek'Sai, G2 have a lot of options in the early game. The late game, that's also, when you talk about the single damage type, one that G2 should be pretty comfortable in. Obviously, they will be facing double tank on the side of RNG and then a Twitch who can sit behind them with a Janna to protect. So it is a tough late game to play against. It's only really Jahu who might struggle to have a lot of impact there. Obviously on the side of G2, a lot of it comes down to execution then with the Megana. And Rek'Sai is tough to play later on as well. Sure. Yuval is just soaking damage. And for me, big question mark is Trick in the jungle on the Rek'Sai continues to be because he's never been the aggressive jungler since the departure of Graves really from the meta. Was much more comfortable when tanks first arise. It was him who first really picked up the Sejuani, made it his own, started to bring G2 back up in the standings. Now having to be the one to set the pace in this game. We enter our final game of the first round, Robin. And you can hear Wuhan fans of the LPL, all of China feels rallied around RNG in this game. 3-0 could be their score if they find the win here. I mean, expectations around RNG are skyrocketing. You look at the players and all of them phenomenally individually talented, but it didn't mean enough for them to win LPL Summer. A lot of these members have been together for a while now. Greatness has not followed in the way you might expect. But until those wheels come off, until we see them lose a game, you can't help but look at RNG like a real contender for more than just this group, but for the world's crown itself. For now, a lot of it is going to come down to the early game. Will they make it to the late game stage? Will the scaling of the comps even matter that much in the end, or will this be blown wide open in the early to mid game? Keystone's a flash, and look at Trick. He is actually running fervor, so he's gone for a very aggressive Keystone choice here. Cinderhawk's kind of, so it's not Cinderhawk, I should say. Courage has kind of fallen away as a choice for the Rex. And this doesn't necessarily tell right. us Warrior or Cinderhawk, but exactly. it's notable nonetheless. Yeah, I think I think Fervor, it's been the standard at least for most of the junglers lately. And obviously Trick will be able with this Rex side to actually play around perks in the mid lane. Jace is bringing Cleanse though to try and defend himself. And this is why it's a real fun thing to talk about because you look at the numbers. We mentioned MLXG and Trick are different. If you look at jungle proximity, the team jungle proximity for MXG, the amount of time he looks for ganks, well, 47.6%. Very, very high. First at Worlds. You then look at his mid lane proximity, first at Worlds. Get Zhao Hu ahead. Let Zhao Hu influence the other lanes. Consider that it's actually G2 that have drafted what we've seen so many times. Rek'Sai going in after the instant snare from Rise. So it's trying to fight fire with fire, but it's not the usual mindset of G2. Yeah, again, that's the funny thing about G2 because they will have these weeks where they don't want to gank mid at all with Trick, but then when it really matters, especially in playoffs after the struggle against Splice in the quarterfinals, they learn for the semifinal and the final that actually we should just play around mid lane. And suddenly Trick started being around perks much more, they started camping the lane. Obviously, it's something again that goes up and down. In this game, I am expecting him to pay attention to this perks lane and try and get the rise ahead because when you're winning mid, you can roam first to the bottom lane. And when our sensors are completed, you can time those roams with the big power spike and you can start taking down towers. And it's surreal that it's G2 with that combination, though. You said misfits with the rise, Rek'Sai. You certainly believe it, but not many mid lane options available. If you don't see mid lane ganks, that would be a surprise in itself. Interesting now. Entire top side clear comes in for Trick, not opting to take the blue buff. Does as a Rexai have the option to donate that away to Perks, maybe set him up for further success, but would cost him heavily in experience. One thing I want you guys to take away, Twitch Jana was the choice. It is Relic Shield from Uzi. Uzi earlier this week was actually going much more laning. Doran's Blade, Doran's Shield, the laning choices. So he's actually opted into the more difficult 2v2 and also the Relic to help his support. Let's see if G2 have done their homework on MLXG if they're expecting any early gangs. He's Looking top very early. This wave is pushing towards left me, so expect will eventually overextend. But because Trick cleared his entire top side jungle, there is no camp for MRC to take while he's waiting for expect to push the lane. But when he sees the top side of the jungle is completely cleared, he lets, of course, his team know the bot side is where Trick is at. They're calling back, yeah, we don't care. We're sitting at tower, dude. Fair. Stop talking to us. Unfortunate state of the match, of course, Targon's not uh, necessarily an item, or rather Relic Shield, to win you your lane. Lots of gold generation here for Uzi, but he knows his place in the early landing phase, just waiting to scale up.
I just want to talk about Cole then on Sven a little bit because I often see people say, ah, greedy, or wow, how can you win lane with Disrespect. Cole? Disrespect. That's so weird. Yeah, exactly. The thing about Cole is, especially against Janna lanes, if you don't need an AD HP from a Doran's Blade, the Cole is basically just as good, if not even slightly better for early laning because you get one less AD, but you get three HP per hit, not three percent lifesteal. So you actually get more sustained back with the goal, and of course the goal. I mean, if you're Sven, you look on the other side, you see Sejuani, probably not going to be ganks early. You see the Twitch Jana know that they're going to be on the defensive side. Jana very rarely auto, auto attacks in lane until the changes on 719 forward. So at the end of the day, there is almost no risk to call. So it's an intelligent. Uh, by and it really is a good read of the game. Yeah, exactly. When you lane against Twitch, very often you get hit a few times and then you get a poison on you and you're never really going to get bursted down. So again, flat HP is not that important. It's more actually about sustain against Twitch lanes, as you can see here. A few hits going back and forth, and that's about it. Sven and Mithy definitely willing to commit the cooldowns here just to try to get an advantage in the lane, but of course Uzi doing a very good job of keeping up in CS, matching the pressure so far. Cole, the really only difference when it comes to gold generation, although the Janna will get a bit more, and MLXG is making his way to the bottom yeah, side. That's what I oh, love spotted. about him. He's so creative in his pathing. He's finding a way down to the bottom lane. Will the lag of 80 HP cost Sven or not? Forward has a bit of damage, but he has committed to the trade. No polymorph burn has used the shield. MLXG is such a patient hunter. He's looking for his prey. Sven walking towards the bush. Has to be careful. What's the dash going to be? This man is waiting so long, but G2 are meanwhile making a play on the top side. Trick is here, Perks is here. They have the point click CC. They can't keep this going. Maganard's on the way, but I don't even think they're going to need it. They are burning through Letney, but the healing is coming in. The double jump coming out, and that's going to be first blood, but it's traded back. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, MLG just backed away. I was waiting for the camera to cut down for another fight. We've seen G2 now try multiple times to go top lane early with Perks and Trick. Expect had to give up his life for that one. It was almost perfectly done, but Expect did not transform into Meganar. And when you see those turret shots, it was about five. It was ramping up. It felt like it couldn't have overkilled him by that much. So good attempt by G2, but trading in a three for one scenario and losing a mountain of turret HP is certainly not ideal for G2. Exactly. Expect is also saving his teleport because the minion wave was so close to RNG's tower, he could let it push back. So that is available for potential fight on the bottom side. But let's see the dive again. He let me know, stay near the tower, gets the CC down as well, and knocks Expect back in towards his turret as well. 250 damage from that last shot this early meant the squishy Nar could do nothing. And if we see Jace take the mid lane turret, that thought for a moment. So Trick is following Let Me. Rice around. Moving in. Does not have the ultimate available. So Juani nearby. Emma, she's not too concerned, but they see him on a wall. But think of the flow on. Jace takes mid lane turret. We know how much damage he can do to turrets when he's left to his own devices. Then you see RNG switch Twitch and Janna to mid lane. There's not going to be any way to really pressure those, that 2v2, if they see the mirror coming through from G2. Rai's going to have less space if he's going to pop in the side lane to make the map plays. In terms of tempo, losing mid lane turret actually sets G2 behind it more than a lot of team comps. And we have to remember, this is not a team you want to lose any kind of tempo, any kind of advantage against. Because when we saw RNG up against Samsung, we saw how quickly they can close out a game, how confidently they can close out a game when you give them absolutely anything. That's the thing. They have so many great stats. On the screen here, we have the gold difference. They have been so good in the post 20-minute mark, finishing these games early, to the extent where another stat I can give you we talked already, BDD, first week done, no deaths. Zhao Hu, Let Me, and Ming are all deathless this week as well. So when it gets going, when the going gets good, sorry, for RNG, it works well as Let Me's first death did come in this game. But now we look on the bottom side, maybe Trick will make this presence known here. Already did some work on snowballing the top side. For now, Spectre actually pretty comfortable to keep trading, but Let Me not giving him an easy edge. And yeah, basically what Jesus tried to do was kind of push this Gnar matchup forward. So we know Gnar later on in the game, especially with Black Cleaver, would be so annoying in the side lane. They wanted to get there faster. They try to deny CS from the Maokai and get some damage on this tower because they know eventually Expect will kill the tower if they just leave him now in a one versus one and they can start looking towards the bottom lane. Arden Sensor not completed yet, but we're getting close. He's here on the bottom side, looking for the Prey Seeker Connect, not going to find any purchase. Not a big enough wave to force a dive, but the tower is getting lower and lower. And this is just a 2v2 laning here from G2 Esports. Sven and Mithy 
with a very good matchup. This is why Varus could have been an option for Uzi to have a better lane. He took the Twitch and he's paying for it at the flash moment. Flash forward, the chain CC on the top side. Quick flash out from Expect. RNG hoping to get something back. Don't even know that the dragon is being taken away from them as they speak. G2 poised to take the bot lane tower as well. Xiao Hu is moving up to the top side, but it may not matter. Tower first blood gonna drop for G2. Nice early boom. They're looking to trade off in objective a long time for RNG to match towers. That's with a Drake already cemented for the side of G2. So G2 will have their first option. They can send their duo lane to the top lane, but probably going to be a dead turret to dive. Weeping forward has the level six. Expect is now in trouble. He's just going to go down. No reason to contest there, but Perks is running into the mix as well. Gets the flash out. Tower not going to go down easily. Meanwhile, the G2 bottom lane is moving into the mid lane. They're trying to double down on their advantages. Wow, they actually managed to defend. That was a greedy play from Expecto and very good punish from RNG. But it's big if they're able to actually force 2v2 and get a free turret. That death, working out whether it's worth it is so difficult, but at the end of the day, being able to force 2v2 on right. G2's terms is big. Yeah, very big for now, but if RNG in the next few minutes can return to either mid or top lane, they can get a lot of gold back. They lost a bit with, of course, the Maokai dying first, and now this play up top here where they kill Expect but not the tower. They're so close to taking down this objective, however, and cashing in. Tempo in the early game here is so important as Perks does force the flash away from MLXG. If RNG could have taken mid lane turret, waited till Hurricane was done, which is done now, and put Twitch and Janna in the mid lane, that was the gold standard. When you see the Tristana, you know that G2 are looking to get the big turret lead themselves. They already have equally low top lane turret. And this uh, Hurricane Rush Twitch is something we really seen a lot of now during Worlds. And it's simply because you will have the Ardent Sensor and you will have your Fervor as well on Twitch here. So you don't actually need early AD to still deal some proper damage. And it does give you a bit of wave clear. Things looking pretty good right now for the G2 bottom lane. The analyst has highlighted the mid lane. It's definitely going to be crucial. But we see the first Ardent coming in for Mithy and Sven. And Sven versus Uzi is somewhere that you oh, have the to mid lane. look. At the moment, it's more about Perks and Trick than moving forward. Let's immediately burn Xiao, who's going to make it out. Bo Summon is used, though. No sustain available for Uzi. Not even the paper sustain that comes through from the Keystone Master that can be taken there. The offensive foe of a choice. And look at this here. CS difference at 15 minutes for Uzi is 9.1 normally. In this game here, he's down almost 20 CS. He's lost his bot lane tower. This top lane tower will die soon as well, but that was a good trade. Important to note, that's not necessarily Uzi sucking in lane. It was a reality of the matchups that have been taken, but certainly a feel-good stat aside of G2. They can take aggressive trades because of the on-hit lifesteal on the Ardent Sensor and the RNG dream of mid lane, pushing fast with Hurricane, then roaming with the Titch Invisibility is still impossible. And RNG has been committing to the bottom side with three members and letting G2 take this tower and start the Rift Hell. MLXG is moving in towards it. I want to see if they actually... No, they don't even want to stop it. They're just going to give it up and hope that Xiao can take mid tower. And it's not an accident that Sven is flashing the G2 Esports logo every time he takes an objective in the face of Uzi, 30 CS up. Uzi's temperament is something that is known to every watcher around the world. And it's simply pressing a button and once again, get, again, getting in the head of one of the legendary AD carries in the history of League of Legends is working, then he's doing his job. It has to be frustrating for Uzi right now. You look across from yourself, the coal is now finished up. Sven's got the extra gold. That means a static ship. He can push anywhere he wants to on the map, and the next target is mid lane. One tower at a time. G2 grinding this advantage out. Twitch still at a single item, not the major threat he needs to be. Exactly, and the, the fact you have lost so much damage on your towers doesn't matter if they're still alive. And with G2 continuing to push and apply pressure, well, RNG are currently sitting with zero turrets. That's Rift Hell coming in the mid lane. Will not instantly kill the tower, but get a bit more damage on it. There to tank it for Sven. MLXG waiting over the wall. Sven has to be careful. No cleanse effects to get him out to safety if he needs it. MLXG in lane. Lane. looking to start. He does manage to land it on Sven. Sven is not out yet. He's leaping to safety. He gets cut down mid-air. Nice pick off by RNG. They will turn onto the Rift Tower. They will not lose their mid turret. Sven pushed up. Felt like he had enough coverage with the Rek'Sai right behind him, but it did not work out. Let's see what RNG can get in return now. 10 seconds on Sven still. Mid lane tower low. Top lane, no one is there, but bot lane we have let me pushing at the moment. Getting a bit more damage on that turret. RNG so bad they want to get this gold here so they can get Uzi towards that infinity edge. 
but the ult already burned from Sejuani. Not going to be able to force out mid lane tower. The wave clear is here. Luckily for them, the Jace now with the Yomu's. Easy for him to cut through this tower if he's given the opportunity. MLXG is here as well, and that means RNG are going to grab their first tower of the game. And we review what we talked about in Picks and Bats. There will be a time when G2 Esports can stack armor and feel good. That time is not now. You get to watch the mid lane as well. Sven walks up, not expecting MLXG from the ramp. It's a great engage from MLXG. You can try and flash away from it, but you got to be ready in the second it happens. And if you're just delaying a little bit, you will get hit and you will die. See, he feels... That's perturbed. your face, then. Definitely Sven face, but with G2. Remember also that for RNG, okay, the armor will come in for G2, but when you have a Jace, honestly, it's much more about damage to structures, and that will never fall away on the side of RNG. So stopping the bleeding of immediate gold. If they find themselves on equal gold footing, even get two picks, turrets explode to Jace Twitch. They hit two items on the Twitch. Team fights at this point, before NAR gets real armor items, are still gonna be explosive. So RNG really are focused on not trading down at any point in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, they did lose that mid lane tower during the replay from before here. G2 now pushing in the bottom lane. Drake is spawning in a few seconds. They should be able to just kill that one very quickly and start going towards the next one. First, a bit of damage on the bottom lane tower. Trying to siege up. G2 definitely at the edge right now. Infernal plus a 3k gold lead at 15 minutes. Looking pretty good. Only one kill to their name on perks. But just the structure gold giving them so much. Now a Cloud Drake should be theirs to take for free. What are RNG going to get back in exchange? For now, it looks like topside jungle vision. That is a correct play from RNG here. Just cross map. You can give up this Cloud Drake if it means you kill the top lane tower. You want gold right now, you don't want drakes. Exactly. Gold. Getting those items before armor can realistically be balanced with damage is RNG's goal right now. It will make very quick work of this top lane turret and also get that insurance with the advanced vision that no Baron plays can come through from G2 when it spawns in about four minutes' time. Hypercharger cuts through the tower. One of the big things we always talk about when we look at teams getting a lead, the hallmark of great teams is being able to come back and being able to snowball a lead. Well, we're waiting on RNG to come back to even things up. But for G2, who need to prove themselves in this game if they want to make it out of the group, if they want to prove they're worthy of being EU LCS's number one seed in the world, they need to show that they can turn this into more than just a few towers and find a much bigger advantage. It's tricky and tricky to do that when easy objectives like outer turrets are taken down. The two drakes definitely are a credit to G2, but engineering multi-step plans to get deep vision against a comp with Twitch and a Sejuani that has already surprised them is more difficult than you'd expect. If he's in the mid lane wave clearing, sure, you have eyes on the Twitch, but getting the sort of vision that Samsung were frustrated out of in the last game, the two wards on one side, to actually be able to push up and take inner turrets will frustrate G2, unless the Realm Warp can be the equalizer. Exactly, like pushing all the way down to a tier two tower this early, often means you won't have vision on both sides yep. because there are two jungles you gotta ward up basically at the same time and you gotta then keep that vision control going while you're sieging on this objective and it's almost impossible to do so that's why teams settle for just pushing the waves towards and past the enemy tier one turrets and then get river vision and wait for Baron to spawn. So this is often where the game just kind of slows down for some minutes. Now the flashy play du jour has been the Rise Zonia's uh, ultimate so far this time. We've seen a lot of them. Zonia's, obviously the armor portion gonna be great against RNG, but that does mean that Perks can kind of copy Crown yesterday who bought a lot of time, split pushing alone and then having an almost guaranteed escape. And maybe that drawing of multiple members will allow them to Look push. at this here, RNG, they want to fight. Perks with the bait, who's either one who could be in trouble. Ultimate's gonna come out. Perks has to cleanse and flash immediately to safety. Meganar is here, but he's gonna turn mini almost immediately. Does not want to complete the teleport. Pressure on the bottom side, but RNG in control. You get such a good play from them. They just move, remove the Maokai from the bottom lane. They don't want to sit and just split push against the Gnar, and they force a fight mid to try and take down the tower and force the teleport from Expect here. This turret is so low, but RNG, they're playing it very safe and stepping away. Don't want to risk giving anything else up. Expect is already pushing in on the bottom side. They know the importance of gold, but farm equally crucial to the tower gold in a lot of circumstances. And I, I think we both, the Fisher, have to step back and say, it's a light touch from RNG. This is not over-aggression. This is not over-forcing in a line ball game where there's clearly only about two to 3,000 gold advantage. It's not the RNG we saw in the LPL. I love seeing them be smart and just forcing out objectives and not diving in for a fight, not over-pursuing. They're just using the tools they have right now to the maximum and forcing G2 into really bad 
situation. And taking tools away from G2, the cleanse and the flash gone from Perks is massive before we even have the Zhonya's completed. No get out of jail free card, no easy escape for Perks if he does get cowed out here on a side lane. And it's once again G2 waiting for Baron to spawn and waiting for the next Drake to spawn at the same time. It should mean Uzi gets his Infinity Edge before that big objective is here, currently sitting on only about 400 gold. So there's still a bit of time uh, for G2, but obviously rushing down a 20 minute Baron is not exactly easy. I mean, the game stalled out, and if you consider what we're seeing on our screens, Ven walks up, pushes a minion wave, Twitch exactly. gets all the waves, all the minions. So the outscale duo, and both Twitch and Tristan are obviously strong in the late game, but Twitch Jana as a duo, I believe, very, very, very powerful when it comes to the current meta, is getting equal CS with the Tristana that was Snowboy, that was dictating the pace of the game just eight minutes ago, and that's ideal for RNG. So it's important now that G2, G2 are ready for Baron to spawn so they can start putting pressure there. Not necessarily rush it down, but put pressure, and that's basically by putting down these early control wards and then deep vision in the enemy jungle. So now, RNG constantly have to think to themselves, they could be on Baron. We gotta stay around, we gotta maybe go in and try and face check and see what's happening. And that does give openings for G2 to either get a bit of damage on RNG or maybe start a full on fight. RNG do get to play their side lanes, Maokai has the teleport advantage, that's what he expect, leading with his face. Gonna pick up the blue buff as well, important to take it away from the Jace, not the tier Jace of old. All lethality and armor penetration means he can run out of mana very quickly in a fight. Now a 2k gold difference between them. G2 maybe hoping for some mountain drakes instead of the Infernal in the Cloud, but still a good look. And it's so many small steps now, because once you get down your control wards in that river near the Baron, you can go into the enemy jungle, get a bit of damage, maybe steal a camp, and then you gotta reset. You gotta go back to base and rebuy your new control wards. So while the enemy team is coming in to kill your current ones, you return with new ones instantly and get back the control. I think reset's a great word, because resetting expectations it's actually relevant just to item spikes in this game. I read this that if, Inf if Infinity Edge, which should be completed soon, comes in, then I think teamfight-wise, RNG win at true 5v5s until the armor comes in later. So reading where the game is at is very subtle in this particular matchup. So now we just saw RNG there kill the wards away from the Baron. G2 saying, we don't care because we know you have to go back to base now and buy your new items and get your new wards. And then G2, if they want to, can just walk straight back in, get the new control wards down, and you have this little dance happening until a team is strong enough to actually kill the Baron itself. Mythi playing it very safe, just placing a ward over to check if anything is happening. But there's no tank on the side of G2. If they want to start this Baron, who takes the damage? Rek'Sai, Rek'Sai. a decent option, but it's definitely not the Maokai. Lulu shields it. with the Rek'Sai, the stacking armor is enough to sit in front of Baron. And I love the dance, because League of Legends is a dance. It takes two to tango. I love how right now we're getting to the point where the dance style will suit RNG. When Infinity Edge now completed, I feel like right now they win fights. When the slow dance comes, when the late game comes, Armor items will be there for G2. So it's so subtle, but where the pendulum swings right now, I feel like RNG, if they get a 5v5, they're gonna gleefully accept it and go straight 5v5. Terrifying prospect, especially now with Uzi finishing two items, having the Jaina, the AD steroid, much more impactful. And the little procs of picks on the side of Minty. They got the early lane control, it got them their lead, but now there is a difference in what the supports can bring. So you move later into the game, Trick. Fighting hotly for the blue buff, MLXG will take it away. Let's be careful though, Let Me is here. Expect coming in along the backside, but has Let Me overstayed his welcome. Expect coming in, multiple members gonna get CC'd up, but the root has been blocked. That means Ben has free right to approach onto the back line. Let Me still alive. Trick is actually the one who might just be in trouble. He has the flash out, Space is trying to hold on. Sven knocking back the team. Disengage comes out. So right there, we see a few flashes being traded and heal as well, used by Ming. Cloud Drake will once again go over to G2. They would have wished for something different so that more scaling to go forward. But you can't always get what you want. And they'll have to settle for two Cloud Drakes and a bit more movement speed. And it was a team move by Uzi. I don't think you really felt like Quadra Kill was coming out. He was ulting to allow his tank to actually get away. You don't want to give away in a turret. So, so far, G2 have been frustrated at trying to pick up and get the Drake. That means they have a backup win condition later as the Elder Dragon is going to be Basically full power, four to five stacks, probably the four, given when the timer was taken. Things reset though, no significant advantage yet to G2 after all their great early work. Exactly, and then when there's no Drake alive, we go right back to the same Baron dance we saw before with trading control wards against each other. Trick losing that flash though is pretty big for RNG because that is the main engage right now for G2 unless Expect can find that big opening. I'm just feeling giddy to fish. I'm sure some people watching this saying, where are the kills? I thought it was promised kills. Killing RNG, I was promised here. kills to be fair.
but we're getting closer and closer to Uzi and Sven 5v5 fights, Xiao Hu and Herbs 5v5 fights. The inevitability of the Arden Sensa meta, in some games it can be a drag, but in this game I think it will be something beautiful. So it sucks that right now we don't have them, but no team is making mistakes. Both team, uh, teams are playing very smart, waiting for the main event. It hasn't come yet, but the undercard is looking good. Now, of course, a small boon for G2 while they may have given up some of the advantage that they held early in the game. They still got the Dragons and, of course, Frozen Mallet now coming in for Gnar as well means it's much easier for him to be a source of pressure for the G2 lineup. It's a, an important little thing that Uzi is doing uh, very often in this game. He's not instantly showing himself in lanes. And when you play against a Twitch, especially as a Gnar who wants to split push, you constantly need information on where he is on the map because otherwise he might sneak into your lane with the Maokai and just kill you in no time. In a different game, Jace takes the mid lane turret, Twitch with Hurricane goes mid, pushes the wave, pulls back, where's Twitch? Where's Twitch? Could be anywhere on the map. That's the big thing that Twitch, when he can go mid lane, allows you to do. You can see right now, actually, Twitch walking through control wards, making his way to the mid lane. Uzi continuing those headaches for G2. He'll show himself soon. Now moving in, Emma, she thinks he's found the engage. Trick has to back off, Sen so gonna make it out to safety, but there is no flash veil for Trick. RNG are looking to punish, but one more tunnel is gonna take him out to safety and stop the fight in its tracks. We have right now Perk sitting in the top lane, so RNG feel confident forcing the engage. No flash mm. from Trick still. Perks will get the push going, so someone needs to deal with that from RNG's side, giving G2 control of mid. No oh, actually, they want to fight again. Twitch. Looking to get it started. Maokai moving in. That could be the pick that they need. Goodbye to Sven. RNG take control in the mid lane. And again, the creativity right here from RNG is surprising. G2, they're thinking everything is going by the book. But then suddenly, let me show up once again. He's not sitting in that bottom lane. And the defensive play works until it does. No flash from let me, but he leapt across the screen with the righteous glory. With the Twitch ultimate down, G2 did not give respect to another attempt, but that time it worked the trick. You gotta be so fast in your thinking here because they are looking at that wave in top lane saying, okay, someone from RNG is gonna go and kill that wave. They're not gonna fight in the mid lane right now. And then suddenly out of nowhere, the engage happens. Look how confident they are in pushing forward. Basically saying there's no way they're gonna five man mid. And then they're here. Any target would do. And everything on this man dies instantly. That was the second round, of course. We saw the first one earlier. Will be the break of the mid lane turret. Second Sven reaction cam. He's starting to feel the pinch. That's the confidence, and it's so hard when there's so much CC. The point click of the Maokai locking him down. Difficult life for a Tristana, especially when you've already burned things like the rocket jump. It's also because there's been this line of control wards from RNG in their own jungle, which has allowed Let Me to move from bot lane to this mid lane quite a few times and surprise G2 Esports just due to the lack of vision or, or information on where he is. That was without flash. He still got on to the Tristana and forced both summoners from Sven. That is huge for, for the next fight, and it's forcing G2 to play more passive now and giving the control over to RNG. It's just amazing how squared up RNG have become in terms of the fundamentals of the game. The ceilings, we know all these players individually have them. Oh. The fundamentals Finding the game hurts. Hurts. get locked up with some more stacks. Can he get out? Yep. Yes, free escape for the prize. Well, he can face check at least, so that's good for him. <laughs> Uzi will get hit there by the Prey Seeker, still invisible. Expect has to give respect to this. Rank will slow up. Frozen Mount means he's got a pretty easy path out as long as they don't get on top of him. G2 holding on. Five members strong on both sides. Dance around this mid lane, dance around this Baron. I really like Uzi respecting all the armor on G2, getting that early last wisp point, fully upgrading it as well. He knows he'll already get some attack speed from this Janna here. He's ready to take over a team fight. And it's a different build. It's double zeal item, the much more standard build coming through from G2. Even though RNG have the stronger frontline, double super tank with Sejuani and Maokai. So I think Uzi just made the read. If one of those tanks die, the rest of the team is probably going to fall like butter. So killing Expect to, of course, is only tanking on a budget. Ninja Tabi and also some flat resists. And Trick also, who's on a jungler's budget. At this point in the game, it's very difficult for GG to move forward with limited information. And with the Twitch, that's almost always. Now the game suddenly so even. All it takes is one more pick in the favor of RNG to balance everything out. Sven getting caught out again twice now and has been 
Such a big weak point for G2. And on the one hand, you can't blame him because so much CC is coming through, but also, what else can G2 do to protect him? If he gets picked off again, it will most surely be a Baron for RNG at this point in the game. That's why it's so tense. When both teams are this even, if one team can win a team fight and take Baron, they tend to just kind of snowball out of control, taking down multiple towers. They're sneaking in behind, but there's a ward. No one's there. Need to burn it down quickly. No Mountain Drakes ready to move out at a moment's notice. See that they're spotted and just back out. Yeah, and it might be weird, like, why they're not sweeping it or why they're not putting down a control ward first there to see if there is a ward they can kill, but it's because they know they have a backup, backup here to get out with the Rise ulti. And they know that every point of damage needed to go into the Baron to give them even a chance of taking it down. No four hits onto a ward, a three onto a regular ward. Does mean that they sacrifice control of the Infernal, answering Infernal for RNG. A small correction right there from my previous point. They actually placed the control ward just when it tunneled over, but yep. it's so far back in the pit that it doesn't actually see the ward in front of Baron. Still, it is actually a play without a lot of risk because you have the Rise ulti to get out anyway there. Good that they saw RNG moving and got out immediately. Could have been a disaster for G2. Talk about RNG with the potential of Baron while stealing it away while you're stuck in the pit. Definitely not where G2 wants to be. They will, of course, spot out the control ward tunnel there as well. Trick spotted by the sapling, and just both teams continuing back to the Baron dance. And interesting that we find ourselves in this position at this point in the game. Sven versus Uzi, it feels like, for one team fight to win it all. But Xiaohu may be looking to make his mark. And I also want to talk about the difference between a Maokai and a Gnar in these fights here. It is much harder for Expect to have big impact. He needs to time his jumps, his Mega Gnar, his ulti almost perfectly. To have the same impact you're going to see from a Maokai who can point on click on a target and then apply a ton of follow-up CC very easily right after that. And when you equate, honestly, Gnar and Maokai as champions, Gnar is definitely tilted towards the laning portion, the ability to auto with the Hyper and the Frozen Mallet in a team fight in the ideal sense. He'll do it maybe a little bit more at the five man now from Hornster than Let Me, but the reliability and the fact that he can get in there with the new ultimate and do work means that Let Me really, if he's forced in fights, the true 5v5, if RNG initiates them, how can you expect, expect to have everything in order to make the same sort of play? Yeah, because GG are now feeling weaker here as a five man unit for the reasons we highlighted, they're giving up the control. They've had to, like, their comp got ahead in the early game. They could have tried to push even deeper down towards the tier two towers, but we talked about how difficult it is in the current meta to do it. So they were kind of waiting for Baron and it bought time for RNG and now RNG have taken control. It feels like Ryze is the only champion that can kind of push past the mid lane because we know that the river has been littered with control wards. And that control ward line is a you shall not pass sign for what we've seen from G2 in the past 10 minutes. Interesting, interesting position they find themselves in. Jahu splitting up, pushing that wave. Meanwhile, expect pushing on the bottom side, but not confident enough to push any further than that. Starting up a slower push, ready to move back to the team. Not looking to play to the side lane, just ready at any moment to fight that 5v5 alongside his teammates. And it's all just these uh, small wards being placed in the Baron pit. Never only lasts you so long if you are T2 Esports, because eventually you will have to walk into this river without any vision and risk RNG opening up with a Twitch out of nowhere, just destroying your back line. Approaching a second zeal item as well, Uzi just gets scarier and scarier. Sven may have had control in the early game using the demolitionist properties of the Tristana, but now Uzi in the late game, the unknown factor of the Twitch, where is he gonna pop up? The ability to hit multiple units feels like it just gives him such a clear edge in these fights. Both to engage and also to get safe Baron vision. RNG have to find a way to park deep wards in the red side jungle of G2, something they have not been able to do. Last ward was on the Raptors, just cleared on screen. So that does continue to extend the game. Finding a way to pull that off is gonna be difficult. They could take the inner mid lane turret. Baron becomes so much more straightforward for RNG. Or if G2 can find a way to get vision control in the Baron pit itself, make sure there are no wards from RNG, they can still use this team had to blast cone over the wall into the Baron pit and use the Rise ulti to get out again in case RNG show up. There are ways to unsurprise them, they're actually going for a fight instead. Burks moving in, looking to pick off MLXG, he's quite tanky, but the whole team is here, ready to find a pick onto the jungle. This could mean the Baron, but he's going to make it out. Now they're Uzi! trying to turn it, Uzi on the backside. The Assassin's Twitch, Expect has something to say, but he's already out of the fight, he's been knocked back. That is a massive win coming in for RNG. Perks firing back for the side of G2, but with Sven already dead, there's not a lot of options left. Uzi's cleaning up house, he's looking for a triple, but Xiaomu 
Ryan's the one to bring it home. One of the first times we've seen Uzi skulking around for a team fight. He finds it on his turn. Miffy dies with everything up because he dies in an instant. RNG being chanted around Wuhan. They're going to get a lot from this, RNG. No time for the Baron. Don't even need it. They have an inhibitor in their sights. They know the death timers. They know what's open to them. They're going to break open the base of G2. 34 minutes it may have taken. A losing early game, but RNG is in control. And they're going to take both the sides. Here you think two inhibitors is very possible. Still five seconds for Sven. See, let me and the rest of RNG be respectful. Definitely very respectful. I actually think going for the base made sense to say, you know what, it's not about forcing a Baron fight because we want to have a Baron fight. It's more about getting an objective here. But we see G2 notice that Jace was near the Baron pit, so they thought they could take a 4v5 team fight, but they lose track of Uzi. This is why it was so hard for G2 to ever push forward, and they just die instantly. Uzi even got a few hits on the Sven. And it's just absurd how much damage the Twitch is able to do at this point in the game. Uzi feels untouchable. When G2 aren't prepared for him, everything falls apart. And we haven't seen this Twitch that often. Oh, G2's straight on Baron. MLXG 3K drop, and the ulti is going to go in. Who's going to take it out in the end? G2's going to get it, and they get out with style. Well, Quick that, call. That's a different one. That's a <laughs> cliffhanger change right there. Everyone from RNG after they took down that tower just recalled, went back to base, and G2 rushed it down. Had to. Except the risk that MLSG was in there could maybe even get it, but G2 burst it down and they felt behind. They felt like they had to do something crazy. Hey, when your back's against the wall, sometimes you gotta flip a coin, sometimes you gotta take a chance, risk it all. But G2 able to secure it, able to get out, and suddenly the game is even, or at least feels like it once again. Well, we're going to get another fight now around the Elder Drake. Uzi, four items fully completed, and a QSS. We saw the damage in the last one. A few crits at Sven or Mithy. They're both dead. They're finding someone. Yo, Moose. To pick off Mithy, they saw how easy it was last time, how squishy the Lulu was. He that he like to be Uzi going in. Perks is in trouble. Does he have the Zanyas? Doesn't even need it. Is going to get healed up by the Redemption, but the ultimate not available for Uzi yet. It is, however, on the way. Expect he gets locked down before he can go. Mega could be everything. MLSG takes so much damage. Meganar leaping in. Who can he throw back? It's Uzi into the wall. That's a three man. Not going to be able to find much else. Marco Storm play activated. Sven free hitting onto the backside. Uzi going off where he can, but G2 is oh, leading up the rest oh. of his team. He's been zoned out of the fight. GA proc for Zhao. Let me doing what he can. Expect to forward. Mini Nars on the way. Locked up. Zhao trying to turn it back onto Mithy. Purse not going down yet. Uzi is a Alive and full health though, he has returned to the fight. He has but RNG has to back off. He's waiting for the He's he trying to turn it. Double kill coming in from Sven. He's gonna back off as well. Both 80 carries living through the fight. Uzi was holding on and waiting for the spray and pray. Did not have the movement speed or the ultimate available at the same time and thus was not able to open up in a manner like he wanted to. Very good from G2. The moment the first auto attack with spray and pray came through, everyone backed away. No value for RNG. Exactly. Sven just shot Uzi away out of range with this one. MLXG was the man who got caught at first because RNG was splitting up. They tried to take down perks. No ulti from the Twitch track to do it. G2 now with three drakes will also get the Elder Drake. It's a big turnaround for them. Still a minute and 20 seconds left on Baron. Four stack Elder Drake. 180 bonus damage. Next fight for RNG could be do or die, but it's gonna take G2 to siege, it's gonna take G2 to dive, I don't think they're gonna take the risk. They've got about a quarter of the Baron buff as well, so bringing up the minions, hoping for at least an outer, mina, sorry I said, bot lane turret. Push up for that, that seems pretty risk free. RNG picking their battles. Doesn't look like this is going to be one of them. They can't know that Jace is on blue buff at this point, so they'll be respectful G2. Now a brief, Brief pause, a brief breath before our next Ooh. big fights. 40 seconds left on the Baron. Elder Dragon buff still powerful, but does not just let you walk through an inhibitor tower for free. And it's fun to see the difference in fights here. Sven, of course, to hit the tank in front of him, and he needs enough time to take down that tank. While Uzi, because of his ulti with Twitch, can actually sneak around as well and then hit almost everyone on the side of G2. So Uzi, much more of a threat for the entire G2 team. Sven just about one target at a time. And note that since we saw Uzi delete members, Warden's Mail and a, a Bramble Vest, also the completed Randowans for Trick. So the tankiness. Oh, Uzi's up here. Again. He's trying to pull back. Perk's hungry for the play, but not going to move too far forward. Knows who get out damage in the pure 1v1. Uzi at a terrifying point in the game. We also can't forget the battle of the mid laners. 
playing at Jace in late game team fights, it's very, very difficult. You are so squishy. When you jump into melee form to deal proper damage, you just end up dying very quickly. We saw Perks in the last fight find Xiaohu, take him down first. That is going to be a problem for RNG, so they're going to rely on Uzi's damage. Let's see the fight again. And this is the first time when they turned on to Perks, they could burn him down, he doesn't die. And G2 actually gets access to members. It's been impossible for them before. They've been denied actual fights where they could take the lead. And this time they turn to MXG and RNG a bit all safe. Exactly. MXG using his dash to deal a bit more damage was really not smart. So he meant he couldn't get out of the fight. Right here, G2 cannot get out to Uzi. He's so far back. Triggers a fine time, but they're on to the Jace instead. And then the Maokai right after. This man may not be an AoE threat, but closest target he can deal with. You cannot imagine how frustrated Uzi he was when three to 500 health members were lining up. He did not have ultimate until just now and wasn't able to get the maximum value that he would have just a moment early. Heal burn just for the movement speed steroid. A nice info buffer there from Sven to get out of the CC coming in from MLXG's all. But we can see the story of this game in this damage graph. 80 carries are king. Two of the best 80 carries in the world fighting against each other. Everyone else here just trying to help them, trying to set them up to succeed in this game. Now it becomes a lot about the Baron again. Spawning in two <laughs> minutes, RNG will push up mid. We talked about late, late, when G2 could actually balance damage with tankiness. Feels like we're getting closer. Still could be some magic from Uzi, but G2 can stack armor confidently at this point. Except for Sven and Mithy. Sure. Not really able to get enough to make a big difference. So if the Twitch is not under control, he will get to them. Constant information and communication about where did you last see Uzi? Where is he moving in this fight? G2 Esports will struggle to 5-on-5 five five hard on engage if they don't see the Twitch first. And you also take your steps, right, the Fischer, when it comes to control wards on your flanks. They can be skirted around, but you can do your best to deny Twitch getting access to the backline. Shouldn't happen when you're fighting around the areas they are. They're sitting next to their inhibitor, waiting for information. They don't need to be further out, so why walk up if you're G2 and risk the rat ruining your day? And it's just insane how much impact a good Twitch player can have on a game. Because it's not only just in the late game fights, Early on, we talked about how Expect was afraid when it comes to pushing his lane too far because Uzi might show up in stealth with the Twitch here. If you don't have control in at least two lanes that are pushed far down to know exactly where the AD carry is, it stops you from playing very aggressive on the map. And a lot of credit to Uzi and his performance so far. Small note, Ming wasn't able to sweep the one ward around the Baron there that you can see on the mini-map. That was something that... Maybe Uzi will walk over if he's looking for a flanking position. Probably safer to stand behind your tanks, and Uzi is spotted here. This ward has not been seen. Uzi on the way. Second that Baron spawns, push and cut through it quickly. The whole team is there to back him up. It's seen now. Will get spotted out. They know they're in control of the pit, but they still don't know where Uzi is. Not even going to auto-attack the ward. No need to reveal himself. G2. Still not so confident in this movement. And G2 is staying still in the mid lane. They got to move fast here. Well, they group up in that funnel, Twitch can just let it rip and cut through the teams. But RNG aren't going to set that up, not worried about it. Just want to play the slow game, looking for a juicy opportunity. Very large wave in the bottom lane that led me will have to go down and kill as well. Not a problem for him as the Maokai. Important that RNG killed the Blast Cone behind the Baron, stopping G2 from using that to get into this pit again. And that's the cool thing is that an objective for them, honestly, was killing the Blast Cone. Not usually, but now you can only go one way with the Rise Ultimate. The Realm Warp will take you in or out. You will not have the Blast Cone and then the ability to Realm Warp out. And that is pretty significant. This is another thing that RNG doesn't have to respect. And I like the fact that Sven is going Essence Reaver in this game here. You need cooldown reduction for your Q. You want to have that bonus attack speed as often as possible in the fights. Another one as well is his ulti. Talk about it after. Baron has started. Let me come from behind. The MLXG is here. He's been stunned on the front line. Gavin dishing out as much damage as he possibly can. Leaps into the pit. Redemption is there to back him up. Baron is dropping, but no one is taking it. Uzi! Backing off. Uzi's going in. Expect needs to go mega, but it's too little too late. Uzi is cutting through G2. Expect finally going to knock Uzi into the wall. But it does not matter. Perks get out for free. But it's G2 who pay the price. It's not a pencil, but it feels like one the crowd knows how big that was the inhibitor already exposed officio with his hands up uzi did it again exactly rng saw g2 start the baron and said thank you very much g2 you're lining yourself up for uzi to just kill you 
so easy for him to get that quarter kill and take down the entire G2 Esports lineup. Hurts grasping at straws. RNG bringing it home. Might not even need the minion wave to close this one out, but they've got one just in case. It was a rough early game. G2 outmaneuvering them around the map, but they did not lose hope or focus. RNG reminding people why they are the representatives from China, showing us exactly what they can do and cleaning up their week with a 3-0 performance. This is a Royal Never Give Up unlike no other. Smart macro, game winners in multiple positions and in a meta where you shield an AD carry. One oh, yes. of the greatest to ever hit the rip. Wuhan explodes, Royal Never Give Up, 3-0 up and looking outstanding. They just wanted to get to late game. They just wanted Uzi to get three items. They didn't care about the armor stacking on some of the G2 members. They knew Uzi would find the correct positioning to hit everyone. People talk about bold predictions. People tweet them out. I don't think anyone would have said that RNG would be played better Team League of Legends. I'm not talking about sick outplays, smart macro League of Legends than first Samsung Galaxy and now G2. We thought we understood what RNG were, and they're taken out of that box and suddenly in a league of their own. Patience so many times, not doubling down, being happy, just getting a flash and a cleanse and an exchange instead of committing for a full a blast 5v5. Cone. Getting a blast cone. What's those, important? <laughs> those little things that make the difference. And you, this is not the team that would go in on a 5v5 opportunity. They saw the gold deficit. They knew what they needed to play towards, and they waited, and they were patient. And we gotta turn it over to G2 as well. We see some of these issues we've seen before where it becomes too slow. It becomes too passive. You allow the enemy team to get back in the game. You give them a chance to set up their carry to succeed. And then a super greedy Baron call in the end. When you start that Baron, you sit five men together with zero chance of knowing where Uzi is and then stopping Uzi as well when he opens up. But the Fischio, we talk to analysts, we talk to players, we talk to coaches, and all of them say, why are people sleeping on G2? They're really good. They were really good in this game, but the group is so competitive. Definitely is the case. Well, to get some more insight on that game, we're going to send it over to the analyst desk. Thank you very much, Dracos. And in the final game of the week one of group stages, RNG come out on top, moved to 3-0, and total control of the group. But they did it by investing into Uzi, the world-class AD carry, the guy who's been to Worlds so many times, has so much experience on this stage, and he pulls it off in the final team fight on Twitch. With that, we're going to pull up that final team fight right one more time. Relive it. This replay brought to you by Acer Predator. And now it's just a question. The caster said it themselves. Look at that. That is a Penta that Uzi can smell. G2 are all grouped up. They went for the Desperation Baron, and it's one, it's two, it's three. Can he go all the way? And Perks denies. <laughs> I was so sad, to be honest, when Perks got out of there. Just because you want to see Uzi get the Penta. Could this crowd have been any more excited, though, really? Could Uzi have been any more excited? Look at that. Whoa. I mean, don't go for RNGs it. finally solidifying themselves as the top dog in this group. As Papa was mentioning, what team were we going to get? Well, they just dismantled Samsung. And even though G2 was pretty good in this game, they were better. They, as a team, played around Uzi so well that it seemed like only Sven and his ultimate was the answer to him. And honestly, I had a lot of concerns and a lot of questions. You know, Uzi went into the LPL finals. He was two games up. He has never won a domestic championship, and he gets reverse swept. Uzi has a reputation. He's known as kind of being that, that drama queen sometimes. That He can have these outbursts on stage. We've seen the emotional reactions. Those are the emotional reactions you want to see from Uzi. When he's screaming, when he's laughing, when he's smiling. I'm just so happy to see the evolution of this player as he's matured and come into kind of that, that captain's helm almost for his team. I mean, it's fantastic, but to be fair, it didn't come all that easily for RNG here. We are going to take a look at another replay. This one does go in favor of RNG, but we're going to follow that up with a G2 stab at a Baron. And I think so much of this game to me came down to the effectiveness of the front line from RNG. When you compare how much Maokai and Sejuani were able to get done in comparison to the NAR 
and the Rek'Sai, it's, it's just not even close. And the anti-synergy coming through here, Tristana actually alting Uzi away from that Gnarl 2C. Yeah, and unfortunately, replays like this, I know we just had back-to-back, -back, it doesn't show how well G2 actually played this game. Because if you go back to the early game, they were so strong. They were running Tempo, they had the Rift Herald versus Tower. You know, everything was, was lined up for them, and it was just RNG looking for these team fights. And for me, it's so interesting about how the teams approach the different objectives. You know, G2, they're like, oh, we've got more men on the side of the map. We've got the pressure advantage, the wording advantage. Let's move it around. And RNG are like, did we hit the CC? Okay, <laughs> kill him. Right, but you see that fight won by RNG, and you would pretty much just that they roll through to the victory fairly easily from there. No, not the case. G2 respond. They end up with the Baron. Let's take a look at this one. Very intelligent call here. And this is the call that G2 realizes that RNG is not on the map, so they can go ahead and rush this. But the cool thing about it is that the Rise Ultimate is available, so they can burst it down, no threat of a steal, and they escape. This is just a picture-perfect Baron rush, utilizing the tools at their disposal. And that's accessible because G2 had better wave control of the side lanes this entire game. RNG had smaller windows of opportunity where they had to look for fights. Many times we thought, where are they going to go for Baron when Dragon was... Uh, Available, they chose to just go for the safer place, rely on the scaling of the Twitch, and just know that one team fight was all that it was going to take. It means that there's faults, that you can still break RNG. There are There is this Achilles heel in the way that they like to play. I'm glad that they face, you know, the patient, slow play style, and they were able to bracket, uh, break it, force G2 to play their style, come into that Baron, but a smarter team can play around this. And while I do think we had a lot of high highs and some incredible team fighting, I think, you know, talking about positive for G2, I think their bot lane was fantastic. Somewhere I do have to levy some criticism is how much did Nar really get done, right? Nar was pretty much going even with a Maokai in lane. The Maokai's team fight effectiveness is so much higher than that of, of the Nar, in my opinion. It's easier to execute, it's more consistent. And Nar is going for a split push build. It's not as though he's rushing at Randowins and going into a thorn mail and trying to build to act even as a front line. He went frozen mallet, black cleaver. What did expect get done in the side lane that game? Well, not only is expect not really the main carry for G2, but when you're playing a split pusher and you're up against an invisible twitch, it becomes really tough for you to say, oh, I'll take the side lanes and just hit the turret while everybody's mi missing on the map. That's a fed twitch that is going to find you and murder you if you get caught out. So the entire pick in itself is just failing to recognize that twitch is effectively one of the counters to a split We pusher. heard it from the casters. You get into that late game and it was noticeable that G2 was too afraid. They were afraid, rightfully afraid, to push beyond certain points because of the threat of that Twitch at any point. And to your point around the NAR, I mean, many other tanks available at that point mm -hmm. with looking into double AD, double AD champions, Jason, Twitch, perhaps a Shen. I know we're all a little bit wishy-washy on the Shen pick, but there were other true tanks available that may have lent themselves a bit more to the team fights that this game ended up being decided by. Yeah, and it's there is a way to execute around the NAR. Yes, you put them in the side lane, you, you force pressure, you know, they have to get them to respond, but that also means that you need to find the pick then. You know, if, if they're responding to the pressure that NAR has created on uh, a side lane, it means that Perks needs to step up and be the hard CC, that he can find that Twitch and pop him. But Uzi just did a great job kind of slipping around, you know, the fog of war, hiding, using his stealth appropriately. Now, let me ask you this. The way this group is shaking out, we got 3 0 2 one, one 2 and 0 3 What's your assessment of the group, though? Because I feel like, you know, even at the one and two, G2 has shown us some pretty spectacular glimpses, again, in this game, kind of getting out to a lead and showing RNG what's up. But they did get dismantled by Samsung Galaxy. There's been a whole lot of trading back and forth. It's hard to judge the power level of this group. But I don't want to just say that because Samsung beat G2 that they're automatically better. Like, right. yes, they were the favorites coming into this. And yes, most analysts would back Samsung over G2, but G2 have shown more consistency over the course of their three games than Samsung have. So I'm waiting towards G2 in terms of where this breaks down in the group. Your way towards them, for, for me, I think RNG is just on the afterburners at this point. They are just getting so far ahead with the 3-0. That's a pretty good buffer zone for them to get out of the groups, and they can start thinking about, okay, Fenerbahce is most likely going to be a victory for them. That's a 4-0 team that will 
likely have a first seed getting out of group stage just because of the way that they have played and the two teams below them that are struggling so much to find a win with their identity that they have brought to the table. And I mean, current form aside, G2 is in a tough position because they are one win down. Whether or not Samsung played well this week, they are sitting at two and one in the groups and they have an advantage going into the second week. They also have a few days to fix their problems. Absolutely, it's how the chips fell, right? At the end of the day, they've got the record that is superior win to is a G2. Win. And so G2's got some work to do in week two if they plan to get out of it. What exactly exactly would you pinpoint in G2's play, though, to improve upon? Because as you mentioned, you said they, to you, look more consistent in a sense than Samsung Galaxy. So it's kind of hard to say, well, you got to improve on this laundry list of things to actually, you know, make it out of the group itself. Uh, to me, it looks like decisiveness, but I come from the LPL. So the lens that I have is that when you have the lead, it's understanding that you have it and then forcing that lead. G2 do a good job forcing their leads around again. You know, we have more members on this side of the map, so we can pressure this or we can take this tower, we can chip it here. But they don't necessarily have the same consistency in their team fighting decisiveness. We need to fight right now. We can engineer a pick like this. Well, as we've arrived at the end of week one, let's go ahead and pull up the standings where we've got Longzu pulling ahead in Group B with Immortals gaining a lead on the Gigabyte Marines and Fnatic. Over in Group C, RNG have the edge after three straight wins. And in Group D, there's a close fight in the top between TSM, Misfits Gaming, and Team WE, who are all tied after the first round. Robin, that's the group I want to talk about, the three-way tie for first in Group D. I mean, I think TSM and, and their fans always are going to be getting a little bit nervous. I know that last year at Worlds, all the NA teams were sitting at 2-1 and one after week number one. And despite the fact that I still feel like NA has improved, I still feel like this is a realistic performance from them. And that even if we repeat these, you know, these records, we will get out of groups. It's always in the back of your head. Two years ago, 0-10 in the second week of groups. Last year, two of the teams flaming out in the second week and only Cloud9 making it through where they then lost to Samsung in the quarters. For me in Group D, it's the Misfits. They have been improving every single game and taking that game off of TSM, the fact that they were so much cleaner than in the previous times and were showing signs of a Misfits team that was reminiscent of their EU LCS performances with a lot of confidence, not just in their play style and picks, shows a team that is not going to hesitate or struggle against Team WE or the Flash Wolves. And if they can get a repeat, the POE kryptonite of TSM, <laughs> this team that people had placed at the bottom of the table as a wild card almost of all rookies, all of a sudden actually has a realistic chance of making out of this group at maybe even first. And I've got to echo you because to me, the most important part about Misfits is the game-to-game -game improvement. Yes. When you look how bad they looked in game number one to how well they played against TSM, it's like, damn, the sky's the limit. That said, I also want to put a magnifying glass on Flash Wolves because, yes, they are 0-3, so it's not likely that they'll make it out of the group. Still technically possible. Absolutely. But the thing is, is now they can definitely play spoiler, and all three of these teams didn't have the cleanest games away from Flash Wolves. So just because it is a tie for first place doesn't mean you can overlook the LMS representatives. We're going to put a pause on this conversation because we're about to send it down to Shox, who is ready with RNG support. Thank you very much, Dash. Of course, I wanted to get a word with someone from RNG after going 3-0 and zero and looking like one of the most impressive teams in the tournament going into next week of groups. Ming, uh, what do you think has been the best thing about your guys' play this week? What has been going so well for RNG that you were able to have such an impressive first week of groups? Uh,我们中间一些抉择,然后还有一些机会能力都抓得特别好玩,然后我们之前有一些时候沟通也是没做好,然后现在细节啊沟通啊做得很好,然后现在赢得也最初那进出效果了吧。Uh, so we were able to actually play the game well and also um, capitalize on um, enemies' opportunities. Um, when they gave an opportunity, we were able to do stuff with it. And also, um, off of the stage, we've been practicing a lot, and um, we've been trying a lot of different things. And um, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna try practice more. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, um, so one thing that has been going really well is the bottom lane. You together with Uzi has been very, very impressive. And I heard that you are also a big admirer of Uzi, even though you're next to him in lane. What has it been like going through this experience? You've only played together for about a year, and then not too many games. How has it been playing with Uzi on stage in this World Championship? 所以你跟小狗搭档的话也是有一年了，而且听说你是个呃小狗的粉丝，基本上算个粉丝吧，算你天天坐在一起。那这一年来的话，你觉得跟小狗一起打比赛的话，尤其现在全世界这个呃全球
？嗯，我觉得，感受就是小狗特别照顾我吧，然后我自己打不好的时候，它会跟我说一些鼓励的话，然后就说没关系，然后而且它也教我教会了我很多东西。我这一年来学的东西都基本很多都是他教的吧，所以也很感谢他吧。然后现在我也想付出自己的努力，然后回报他，然后尽量尽量保护好他吧。Um, so this year playing with uh, Uzi, uh, Uzi, I think that um, he's been really taking care of me. He's taught me a lot of things. And also every time when I'm um, feeling down, he's always encouraging me to do better. He's telling me it's okay. I feel like he's taught me so much. Everything I've learned this year was all taught by Uzi. I. So now I think it's my turn to um, give back to him and protect him with my life in the games. Oh, fantastic. And you have been protecting him with your life, but I have a stat for you because you have been deathless across the group stage so far. You're the only member on your own team to not have died. And you're the only person of two players in the entire tournament to not have died yet. BDD is the other one. So did you know that? And, and are you actively trying to keep that record now? <laughs> 一个选手，然后呢，同时又是本次全球总决赛，目前来讲的话，呃，唯两唯二的两个没有死过选手，另外一个是 BDD。那想问一下说，说你知道你这个数据吗？以及说你是不是想继续保持这个零零死的数据呢？嗯、呃，我觉得看队友需求吧。然后如果觉得我队友需要我上去往别的英雄上去卖的时候，我觉得我还是会义无反顾的上去卖吧，因为我觉得这种 KDA 其实也没多大作用，但我想要的是团队的胜利，而不是想要这种 KDA 吧。He said, "It all depends on what my team wants from me. If they want me to play a champion and go and sacrifice myself, I think I will go and sacrifice myself. To me, KDA really doesn't matter. I just want to make sure that my team can get the win in the end." Well, that is the right answer, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much, Ming. Fantastic job by RNG, and thank you, Lexi, for your help this week. Now we're going to go back to over to the guys at the desk. Love to hear about the relationship between Uzi and him. It's it's so nice when veteran players are actually acting kind of like that older brother, bringing people into the fold, teaching them, learning with them, and supporting with them. Because I think that it's such a high pressure environment in pro gaming to have someone like that really can make a huge difference. And speaking of high pressure, you know the fact that Ming had to come in after Mata of all people. Yeah, Mata was big the shoes. exactly the shot caller of the team. Ming is also the shot caller for RNG. So when you make the when you see them make those very clever macro decisions it's that guy that's pulling the strings and I absolutely love his answer to the final question if my team needs me to play a champion and go in and sacrifice myself I will now I'm just hoping that that'll actually happen <laughs> let's see something like an Alistair or a Thresh no more Janas and Lulu's it's time now to go ahead and highlight some of the individual performances from the first week of the group stages here are your best of the rift brought to you by T-Mobile America's best unlimited network now these four players made a huge impact for their teams. They are SKT's Wolf, Long Zoo's BDD, RNG's Uzi, and TSM's Hauntzer. First up, it's SKT's Support Wolf, who's looking to take his third title in a row after a good start to the group stage. I think you have to look no further than this play to say that Wolf is worthy of being the best of the Rift. But it's not even just that. I think he was fantastic. He was extremely consistent throughout the laning phase. I helped. I think he gave so much help over to actually Bang to enable him to carry a lot of these games in later stages. And that's exactly what Wolf and the rest of SKT can bring to the table. They are clutch, and that's what wins, wins championships, being able to perform the most optimal play at the right moment. One of the biggest comebacks in world's history from a deficit at 25 minutes. Next up of the newcomers, we are excited about going into the group stage was Long Zhu's BDD, who's done well so far in his first world championship. And you have to remember that BDD came in as basically the person that could live up to Faker. And he has done so by not dying at all. A 23.0 KDA in this tournament. He's got to play Rise. He's got to play his Talia and his Galio. And he's such a pillar for the team. He's basically so calculated in the way that he positions in the team fights, always maximizing damage. And when you have a mid laner that is not even a threat for you to think about, should we go for after him, do we not, then everybody else on the team can shine and he can just support them with He's deathless, you gotta base. go after him. He's one of two <laughs> deathless players in the tournament. You heard Ming, it doesn't you gotta matter ruin the KDA. But it's 
It's about redefining the KDA player. You know, he's not just <laughs> yeah. the selfish KDA player. He's also playing the entire map. Very much so. Our next player is RNG's 80 carry Uzi, who's looking to take his first world's title after falling short in his previous attempts. I mean, he didn't get the pin to that last game, but that said, we do have to talk about the legend himself. He's been to two world's finals. Uh, he's been to multiple LPL finals, has never taken the title, but his performance speaks for itself. This guy has been so consistent and so good for so long. He is a legacy player. He is a legend. Legend. He is an all-star and a superstar. And it's the meta for him, right? I mean, if he's going to succeed, it's going to be in this meta. Finally, we have TSM's top laner in Hanser, who made a statement with some big plays in the group stage, coming up clutch in key fights for his team. Not only does he talk big, he's able to back it up. This guy has been so incredibly confident in the 2017 year, coming up massive, especially in this Flash Rolls game. He really was the catalyst for TSM, enabling them to stay around, enabling them to buy enough time for Double Up to scale up and for them to come back. And to think that last year, he was the point of criticism for the team, an underperformer at Worlds, and then here in week one of the group stages, he's making the players to watch the best of the rift here. Uh, be sure to keep an eye on these players as we continue through the group stage next week. From solo kills to explosive team fights, you can follow best of the rift in more places than ever before. T-Mobile, America's best unlimited network. Love those action shots too, by the way. <laughs> Remember that we start a little earlier next week, kicking things off on Thursday with a fight between the Gigabyte Marines and Immortals at 12 p.m. local time. That's 9 p.m. Pacific time and 6 a.m. Central European summer time. So set those alarms now. The teams in Group C will play their final games on day one and we'll get the rest of our quarterfinalists later in the week. So let's take a look at this Group C as it is going to be the for or rather group. That's Group B's schedule right there. That's definitely That's group, group B. B. Let's talk about Group B. I'm still, group B. I'm still excited about Group B. Look at all of that yellow. I want to see every single Gigabyte <laughs> Marines game because I want to see if they have anything left in the tank. And I think for the North American fans, a lot of it is, can Immortals keep up this pace? Because they looked very good, I think, both against Fnatic and against Gigabyte. And they showed some some hope against Longju. It would be pretty exciting if someone could take them down. They showed some hope, but Longju, like Misfits, have been improving every single game as well. Perfect <laughs> gaming yeah, Fnatic how much? at under how much? 20. And I feel like this team is now at the point where they could just start flexing their muscles and say, look at all the different champions we play. Look at all the strategies. Hey, who wants to battle us in the next round? Yeah, but at the same time, don't you want to kind of keep some things on the, the DL? We don't want to give away everything. No, you flex no, no, everything. See, what we the want is them games. to pick some really random stuff. <laughs> then Immortals can get a win. We got a lot of random stuff this week. <laughs> Hopefully, we get some more random stuff next week. With the first week of the group stage coming to an end, let's take a look at some of the world's big plays sent in to us so far. Brought to you by Acer Predator. First up, it's Hauntzer's great engage against the Flash Wolves. X Amaranthus tweeted, Hauntzer, five-man gnarl. What a god. Let's take a look. Double gets himself out of the way as Kasa lets the ulti rip. MMD there is a redemption. He's going to try and reset it off. Sven Loeb and not dead to the Tarek ultimate. But defensively, Hansa! My god, a five man! No, ultimate! He's going to secure the team by win! I have a good start here. I'm going, going. We can bait. Go! Push the target, push the target. Quickie! Cho, 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 Cho. Go for mana. Nice, nice, nice. We can go forward. We can go forward. Stay, stay, stay. If you wanted to convince any one of your friends to play Nara, you show them <laughs> that video because that is the most perfect Nara ultimate you are going to get, especially on the world stage. You've also got to love how nonchalant they are about it. It's not like, oh my god, the nice Nara. It's literally nothing. It's just like, oh, good job. Keep Absolutely on. stellar play for Hauntzer and TSM there. Next up, Royal Never Give Up pulled off a huge win against Samsung Galaxy. Only Dan H tweeted, my god, Uzi is a monster. What a flank here by Shehel and MLXG. Actually, a stun lands on the core, JJ. Ulti lets it rip, and Uzi gets the kill. Now jumps in on towards them. Bish is going to try and clean one up. That's Uzi. 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 Uzi grabs the double kill. He's going to keep moving forward. Stun lands Oh, my God, Uzi. Triple kill. He's not going to get it all, but he might grab the quadra. Kuve gets out of the way, and RNG smashed the team fight. No, 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 and it's not just you who thinks Uzi is a monster. Pace, you're kind of losing his voice there a little bit. Maybe cranked it up to a 15. He's got a triple kill. He's got a quadra kill. We're just waiting for that penta kill out of Uzi. Maybe it'll come sometime in week two. SKT's mid laner Faker has come to Worlds to prove himself yet again as the best player of all time. Tori Lack said, I think EDG made Faker mad. Damn, after the unkillable De Demon King's incredible shockwave in the turnaround fight. 
They're saving the Drake round. They got two already. Bang is hiding. He's coming. Bang looking to come in. Here comes your initiation. They're right through. Oh, oh, oh my god. Baker Shockwave will find them all. Nah, you should come. Jim, 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 Jim. Okay, okay. Chana, Chana, Chana. Chana, Chana. Okay, next time, don't put it next time, 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 They did it! They fought back from a 9,000 gold deficit and won a team fight against all expectations. And while the Faker Shockwave was the most flashy out of those plays, it was the team coordination out of SKT, especially the trust in Wolf. The team said, Wolf said he's got a good one. Let's trust him in. The ball follows up after him. And that's a game-winning play to shut down EDG's dreams. For our final replay, Power of Evil came up clutch for Misfits Gaming against TSM. Add for Tiga, IYT wrote, damn, Power of Evil, you're a beast. Well played, Misfits. Baron down to half. TSM still looking for more. Sejuani Ulti comes out. Alfari the target. Spirit's Refuge keeping him alive. But Double Lift is down! And Bjergsen runs from Max Lohr as Misfits look to clean up the rest of TSM and end this game! I from Justin, I'm not going to sell. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I mean, Power of Evil finding the angle there on LeBlanc straight onto double lift. Pretty much completely sealed the game, and he was great the whole way through. I mean, you said it, Crumbs. Perhaps the kryptonite to TSM. It makes <laughs> that group very interesting for them to have taken that game today. Be sure to keep sending us your world's big plays at LL Esports using the hashtag Worlds2017 as the group stage continues next week. Don't forget to tune in for Worlds tonight in a couple minutes as Riv, Rusty, and Kobe break down the final day of the week here in Wuhan. Ladies and gentlemen, or you guys, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as if Hi. I'm starting the show <laughs> been over a long again. Week. It so, has been a long week. I asked for all of their big plays. I was wondering if there was any play that stuck out to you guys, a top performer of the week, or maybe one specific play that really caught your eyes. Locking in Nasus. Locking I think that in was a big play. Nasus. Didn't even matter what happened in the rest. That was just the cherry on top. I thought the G2 Baron sneak into using the realm warp yeah, to get nice. out was awesome because you rarely get to see a high octane moment where you put yourself in their shoes they're thinking they're coming they're coming we got to burst this down and get out and it worked absolutely terrifying we've seen a number of the rise ults along with the zonias to get out of uh, you know sticky situations frost what about you any thoughts here yeah i was actually a really big fan of the nasus as well but it wasn't the lock-in <laughs> it was actually when he just made the dive and he's like just come at me Plus 300, 400 stacks in that short amount of time and a game ending as quick as it did. Ac Final point. Actually, here. as a, another realm warp, the one that teleported Lulu into the feather spot. <laughs> oh my God. And she was probably popped. my favorite that, play. <laughs> oh, but I need to go watch that on repeat tonight. <laughs> now for myself, the cast of the entire live broadcast crew. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week for more Worlds 2017. Good night.